everyone, quick vlog here. I just got out of scene Thor Ragnarok. This vlog post is going to go up. All goes well. First Wednesday in December. So, it will have been, because it came out first end of November, a little bit a month. But while not exactly topical, it does mean there's a little room, wiggle room here for spoilers. I'm not going to go full in on spoilers, because my rule of thumb for statute of limitations on a couple months of the home video release, and it's not going to be in home video by the uh, by this time, the first of December. So, I'll get a little bit the minor spoilers, nothing significant, no major plot details, or like nothing, no major plot twists or anything like. I will start off the spoiler-free portion and let you know when the spoilers begin. So, Thor Ragnarok. Uh, film begins... basically... with... Thor fighting Surtur in an attempt to head out Ragnarok. I mean, this is like the first five minutes of the movie. Um, and it turns out things are more complicated than expected. Thor goes back to Asgard, and we wrap up the thing they set up at the end of the last Thor movie that Loki was now on the throne of Asgard, and something had happened to Odin, and whatever happened to him. And we get this wrapped up, and how that wraps up leads to the main conflict with Hela. Hela being the Norse goddess of, well, death. In Norse mythology and in previous incarnations of Marvel Comics, Hela is the daughter of Loki, much as all the other beings responsible for Norse apocalypse, for elements of the Norse apocalypse are in some way or another directly genetically related to Loki, Dormengand. Fen uh, Fenris, that sort of thing. Norse mythology is weird. They get into this into the Lightning and the Storm in the Lightning and the Storm podcast. Uh, it's done done by uh, Miles Stokes of yeah, Jay and Miles explained the X Men podcast as a sort of short run thing during a break in the Jay and Miles explained the X Men podcast. Link is in the show notes. I strongly recommend you listen to it. It's an excellent podcast. It covers effectively the entirety of Walter Simonson's run on Thor, which is a fantastic run. Strongly recommend you read it if you have an opportunity. Much of what comes out of Walter Simonson's run feeds into this film, but not exactly as it does in the... So, Hela has her sights set on Asgard and taking control of Asgard, and she is too powerful or even Thor and Loki together to beat. So they end up becoming separated and ending up on the garbage world of Sarkar. And this is where a significant chunk of the film's action is up. This is where you can see the trailers where Thor, Hulk, Loki are reunited and things can kick off from there. With them having to escape um, Sarkar and stop Hela's evil, nefarious plans. So, that's the minimalist spoiler synopsis. This, so as far as, how's the film itself? Um, this film is interesting, totally. I don't mean this in a bad interest. I mean in the sense of, a lot of the earlier Thor films, the bits that people remember the most of, and well, the, the bits people like about Thor in the earlier Marvel Cinematic Universe films are the comedic moments, and also the chemistry that Thor and Loki have together, that Chris Hemsworth and Tom Hiddleston as actors have together. And the film goes, it's clear that the writer and director, who's uh, the 
mangle his name, and I apologize profusely for mangling his name like this, but Takita Watiti or he, he completely mangles that I've mangled anyway, this tone, there's a tonal bit that gets and works really and plays up and puts on screen very well and I apologize to the director for mangling his um, I'm going to mangle it several times more over the course of this review um Waititi? Um, he, I'm just calling the director as if he was one of the uh, one of the Eternals because I don't want to keep embarrassing myself. Like, uh, the director among his previous works are um, What We Do in the Shadows, which is an excellent, excellent mockumentary about a group of vampires in New Zealand. And has an excellent sense of comedic timing. It has incredibly good writing. It is a wonderful, wonderful film. And the comedic elements from that how to put this coming off off my head. But he the elements from that film, he translates those very well here in terms of how he handles comedic timing and his comedic sensibilities for the writing. Where there's a lot of understated elements to the writing and in terms of deadpan comedy that works incredibly well. There, if there's clips, there's one-liners, there's certainly all that kind of stuff there. But there's also... There's an element to the comedy of the film where it feels very natural. It's not like somebody being witty. When you talk to the other characters who here who are witty, Loki is very much the soul of wit. He's a trickster god. But there are what makes this work is that a lot of the characters here think they're witty or try to be witty and aren't witty, and the joke is they try to do their clever, dramatic thing, and it kind of falls flat. But not in a discomfort comedy way. It's it's the wit of someone trying to tell a joke, flubbing it. But the way they flub it itself, completely unintentional, without the intention of the person who says it, becomes funny. And that is a very tricky kind of comedy to do intentionally. It is something which can come up completely on accident in a blog post, in a let's play, in two, in a bunch of people sitting around a table having a conversation. It's the kind of thing we can, it happens all the time in real life with people just playing off each other on their own. But it's tricky to write it. And... Nuts and the way it occur happens in the film, it feels natural, but it feels natural in a way that isn't improv. Like, there are big chunks of the comedy in, say, Guardians of the Galaxy, which are improvisational in some form or another. The classic bit from the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie, Star Lord presenting the Infinity Gem, dropping dropping it, and then quickly going picking it back up again after dropping out of free. They just roll with it and keep it in. That was completely an unplanned shot. The actor didn't intend to do it. The actor didn't do it as an ad-lib. It was an accident. It was a happy accident, and they kept it. And that sort of thing. And it's working with those happy accidents that allows for a degree of the comedy that the films have, that the Guardians of the Galaxy films have, in addition to having some really strong writing for the dramatic elements of the film and stuff as well. For Thor Ragnarok, the comedy comes from moments which, if you were completely, imp if you were improving a scene, would feel like a throw it in moment, but it's something we just stumbled upon and emerged organically. 
But again, because of the context of how these things happen in the film, it just works. It feels like this happy accident, even though having walked out of the theater, gone and driven home and sat down at the computer and started to talk about it, I kind of go, okay, it's, it felt like a happy accident, but in reality, it probably wasn't. I could be wrong. It could be I sit down with the DVD and listen to the director's commentary and all these bits that were throw-it-in moments were actually throw-it-in moments. That was just letting the director basic director letting the cast perform acting comedic jazz on screen. And if that's the case, that works really well also. So as far as the film fits within the larger Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's complicated. And to a certain degree, it's a big deal depending on how much other directors run with it. I mean, it's the kind of thing with all the other Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. Some more than others. Like, Guardians of the Galaxy laid out a bunch related to the Infinity Stones made it clear to the audience this is what the Infinity Stones are and how they work, or Infinity Stones are and that they're important, and consequently, when they build up to the Infinity Gauntlet, because everyone saw Guardians of the Galaxy, you because it was successful and it was funny and, and brilliantly written and brilliantly acted, everyone, you don't have to spell it out ever again, people get it and enjoy it. Asgard bits don't show up as much because the Thor movies have kind of been something of a mixed bag and lots of people have seen them. You don't have Balder or Heimdall or any of that stuff showing up in other my MCU movies. We get Lady Sif in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. But not to the same... Like, we don't have the rest of this stuff to the same degree. So it's interesting to see how this will play out, because on the Asgard side of things, there's a dramatic status quo shift that is probably the biggest status quo shift that has happened on the Thor side of things, and could potentially play out interestingly in the rest of the MCU itself, Earth side. The question becomes, what do other directors do from this, and how do things go from here when we get to the actual... Uh, to Avengers Affinity War and the way things play out from there. Film score. I'm bring this up because most of the MCU films generally have a fairly superhero movie score with some additional elements, usually of catalog songs and that sort of thing that are added into the mix to flesh out the things the, the, the film. Probably the most dramatic example of that is with Guardians of the Galaxy and mixtapes. So this is different. Um, the score for Guardians of the Galaxy is very much a mix of orchestral and synth in almost equal proportions. Probably weighted a little more on the synth side, and this is part due to the film's composer, Mark Mothersbaugh. And if you go, got your head going, that name sounds familiar? That is probably because of a few major things you may have heard his work on before. You may have heard his work on Rugrats, where he was one of the primary composers of the music for Rugrats for almost the entire run of the show. Basically the entire run of the show. You may recognize his music from other com little comedic movies. Rugrats movie, uh, Royal Tenenbaums, and a couple other of uh, the Wes Anderson films. In fact, like, pretty big, like, like starting like Bottle Rocket to... Like Bottle Rocket to like 
Life Aquatic that Steve's is so he hasn't done stuff after that. Um, but probably the biggest thing you will probably recognize him from is Devo. He was one of the founding members of Devo. In fact, basically Devo kind of his baby, kind of his baby, well, not just kind of his baby. Uh, like it was him, uh, Gerard. Slyle and Bob Lewis, I mar I mangled one of their last names and apologize for mangling Gerald's last name. Uh but yeah. Uh, Mother's Bog's basically been in Dio for Devo for most of its run. With a couple exceptions. Like the Devo 2.0 album project, which is basically a kid's version of Devo. But even then, he organized it and produced it and that sort of thing. So, anyway. The score is really interesting and is very different than the other scores from the Marvel, the Marvel Cinematic Universe while still having thematic through points that make them fit together and draw connections. I wasn't sure if this was Mother's Bog's first film score. Not. Um, done plenty of film scores before this, including like the Lego movie score and that sort of thing. But I think this film score has a chance of getting a degree of penetration that his other film scores really didn't get. It's not like his other scores that he did weren't big or anything, weren't in films that people weren't in films that people didn't see in large numbers. He scored the Lego movie crying out. But it's something definitely different. And it's something that I could see leading to Mother's Ball getting brought on to bigger things. Because, again, looking at his film score background, lots of indie films, lots of kids' films, lots of comedy films. Now, yes, yeah, certainly this is a science fiction comedy film, but, the, but there is enough of this movie that is like really heavily dramatic like life and death serious notes that I think can lead to this and also because this is Thor Ragnarok adapting a story arc by Walter and Louise Simonson where things get very clearly he gets big epic moments he gets big dramatic serious heavy moments that's the point where I think I see if this is going to be a jumping on point off point for his career, not just to being kids films, independent films, comedy films, and combinations of the of the above. That could be the jumping off point here. I'm not saying he's going to go full. Um, and the name just fell out of my head. Uh, Danny Elfman. He's not saying he's going to go full, full Danny Elfman, but this could be interesting. So, going for about 20 minutes, uh, 19 minutes. Should you see this film in theaters? Absolutely. I saw this film in 2D. You could probably get away with seeing the film not in 3D as well. And it's just fine. There are a couple shots in the film, having seen it in 2D, where I went, this shot probably would be more interesting. Not more interesting, but, but would gain something from being in 3D, in terms of these are shots that are clearly doing something with depth of field. Not stuff like, not like stuff popping towards the camera, like, uh, Friday the 13th Part 3, 
a Brad Jones, uh, Brad Jones's Friday the Thirteenth Part Three review, but in the sense of how a lot of the good uses of 3D are these days, which is depth of field stuff, which is actually, I, if I'm giving examples of depth of field, I should put my hand over the camera. Depth of field kind of stuff, where there is stuff where we have foreground, middle ground, and background action. And the, and the audience is able to see things on all three Again, like Guardians of the Galaxy Part 2 with the opening fight scene, which is done through a combination of uh, foreground, middle ground, and background action, with brute in the foreground and middle ground, and then occasionally other members of the Guardians of the Galaxy through their fight, which we don't see the majority of, coming into the background and into the foreground as the fight scene goes on. And us as the audience is getting bits and pieces of the story. So, with the film, Thor Ragnarok, there are several again, scenes, primarily early on in the film, I would say, where this 3D stuff, where the, the 3D element would really come into focus and certainly get something out of it. Later on in the film, I didn't notice any points that were quite like that. Uh, aside from a couple significant sequences, but that's the big ones. So, anyway, I enjoyed the film immensely. As of the time this review goes live, it will probably still be in theaters. MCU movies tend to stick around for quite some time. If it's not in the first run theater still at this point, it'll probably be in the se in the uh, second run theaters. It will definitely be in the second run theaters because, again, this is first week of December. We have a Star Wars movie coming out this month. The Star Wars movie is probably going to bump this out of theaters. So, anywho, if you enjoyed the film, if you'd like to give your thoughts, um, what bits you liked, what bits you didn't like, please post in the comments below. Be excellent to each other in the comments. Um, and refrain from the heavy spoilers. Let's tap dance around those like, baby, like little baby Groot until oh let's go end of January. Give people a little time to see this movie in the second run theaters or watch it on digital or DVD or Blu-ray once it goes out. So until next time, thank you very much for watching. There will be my usual blurb in the show notes for ways in which you can support the show. Later this month, I will be doing a video review on uh, the new Star Wars movie, our live vlog review. That will be my installment of Legend of the Force for this month. Because for this film's installment, of, for the Star Wars movie, we're getting the, sound like we're getting the background of what happened to Luke's Jedi Academy, since we're about there in the Jedi Academy trilogy, now's a good time to cover that, and then in the, when we cover the rest of the series, of that series, make a comparison. Thank you very much for watching, see you next time. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something particularly you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.